Hey, it's Andrew Morgan, host of the Nomcast, the Netflix original movie podcast. Each week, we review the biggest Netflix original movies with special guests from the film industry, the music industry, comedians, and of course, our fellow podcasters. Check us out on the web at nomcastpod.com. Follow us on the socials at nomcastpod. And most importantly, listen and subscribe to us wherever you get podcasts. Hit that beat one time. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Elise. Host of Crackle and Open with Mike and Elise. A podcast about brews, news, and pop culture reviews. Every Friday, we choose a new craft beer from a different brewery and talk about... The history of the beer. What's in it. How it was made. The history of the brewery. Along with tasting notes and more fun facts. After that, come chill with us as we bring you the latest in pop culture news and reviews. So check out Crack and Win Open, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. No, you're gross. You know you're gross. I don't see, I don't... Oh, whoa, whoa, that's not what we do here on FC. That is what I do. <laughs> He's adjusting himself in his car with the lights on. He doesn't yeah. even turn the light off in his car. Uh, Gremlins too. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. <laughs> ah, dads, gotta love him. What have I done? What have I done? Hello, I'm Mike Field. And I'm Mike Butler. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the movie simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to his podcast right now. What's up? Nothing. Just doing a little sneaking around, spying. Nice, nice. Right. Almost like the characters in Spy Game. Yes. The movie we're doing the episode on. I think you're. I think we're that's, doing a terrible job uh, of. It's, that's really. It's really bad. I'm of sorry. introducing this movie. You know what's more terrible is the tagline uh, of this movie. Hit me with it. Go. It's not how you play the game. All caps. It's how the game plays you. Oh, uh, interesting. That's I'll, awful. <laughs> I don't read script. Script reads me. <laughs> <laughs> that basically, why is it all caps? And, and it's not, I mean, yeah, it's called Spy Game, but it's not about a game. My quote is from uh, Tropic Thunder, everyone, in case you don't know that. If you don't know that. Uh, Tropic Thunder is an awesome Tropic movie. Thunder. Awesome, awesome, awesome film. But we're not talking about Tropic Thunder because number one, it's not forgotten. And number two, <laughs> that's not on our list. We are talking about the 2011, 2011, 2001, no, 2001, 2001. Yeah. I, I, I really should know that because, you know, I do write down the facts. The 2001 thriller spy game. Mike, before we get into, I guess, the facts, why don't you let everyone know what it's about? CIA operative Nathan Muir is on the brink of retirement when he finds out that his protege, Tom Bishop, has been arrested in China for espionage. No stranger to the machinations of the CIA's top echelon, Muir hones all his skills and irreverent manner in order to find a way to free Bishop. As he embarks on his mission to free Bishop, Muir recalls how he recruited and trained the young rookie, at that time a sergeant in Vietnam. Their turbulent times together as operatives and the woman who threatened their friendship. I'm bored. I'm already (laughs) bored. This is my game! (laughs) It's not how you play the game. It's how the game plays you. (laughs) Haters gonna hate. I don't know if that, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's. I like that word machinations, and I use it often. And I'm wondering if I use it correctly. I don't know if I do anymore. I'm. I'm a little. I, I use it quite liberally. I use machinations often. The machinations of someone, I guess, the plans and right. And I don't acting know. out those plans. I don't know. So, Spy Game has a runtime of 126 <laughs> minutes. It's rated R. Production budget of 115 million dollars. It came out on a Wednesday. November 21st, 2001, which is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So this is a Thanksgiving holiday release, Mm -hmm. which means the opening weekend numbers are going to be a five day opening weekend numbers. I don't know if they did midnights back. I think they did back in 2001, but I don't know if this movie would have had a midnight. No, back then midnights meant something. Yeah. Like it was a big. Well, 99, that was Phantom Menace. And that's when you started getting those midnight 
No, Midnight right? Releases started with The Lost World. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. But that's, yeah. Uh, but so even back then. So, when, like so yeah. Game. But it came out on a Wednesday. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's a five-day opening weekend release. And it made $21 million. <laughs> <laughs> Domestic, it did 62. Worldwide, 143. Did a lot better worldwide, which is not unsurprising. I think these two actors, uh, Redford and Pitt, have a big a time. Audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it also, it does take place overseas as well. So. Right. Uh, you had uh, three production companies, Beacon Pictures, Toho Toa, and Metropolitan Film Export. It was distributed in the U.S. by Universal Pictures and distributed in non-U.S., I guess, wherever else, by Beacon Pictures. So on that Wednesday, the 21st, it went up against the slate of Thanksgiving movies, Black Knight, which is the Martin Lawrence comedy where he goes back in time. I remember liking that, but I watched it in 2001 when I was like... 14 15 so I, I liked it but i remember seeing it i just don't remember like the jokes i don't remember a lot about it so it must not have been memorable i just don't like I, I like a lot of martin lawrence movies but i don't know if i liked them because i was younger and if i'd still like i liked blue streak when i watched it but i don't know if i'd still like blue streak today blue streak's the one where he pretends he's the pizza guy blue streak's the one yeah. where he pretends he's the cop right no i know but he gets into the because they bury the diamond right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. in the in the uh, the build the new police in the precinct. Police station, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't that the one where he walks in as a pizza guy? He's got the. Weird I think teeth. so. That's one yeah. of his f- yep. first uh, yep. first things. Yep. Uh, you had Out Cold, which honestly I wrote this down and I don't even remember what that movie is. <laughs> and in a limited release, The Devil's Backbone, which is for your Guillermo del Toro fans out there, one of his uh, earlier movies. Well, I don't even know about that one. Really? Is it good? Uh yeah. I gotta check that out. Uh, Friday the twenty third, which I don't know why I even have this because nobody cares about limited releases on, on the Friday after Thanksgiving. But you had Sidewalks of New York and In the Bedroom. In the Bedroom is a really good movie. Uh, the thirtieth of November, the week after, you had Behind Enemy Lines, the Owen Wilson action star. You also had a limited release, <laughs> Texas Rangers, the uh, James Vanderbeek uh, movie with Dermot Mulroney. Do you remember that? No. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. And <laughs> and then the Affair of the Necklace, which is with uh, Hilary Swank. Sounds boring. Yes. It, 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 <laughs> that's a, it a boring title. The week before, the 16th of November, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a movie, and this is why probably Spy Game only did $21 million opening weekend. A little movie called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> or as it's known in England, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which is what they should have just called it because we, we're adults and we can take a longer title, but whatever. They, is they, that why they called it the Sorcerer's it was, Stone? It was the Philosopher's Stone in England when the book came out as well. And then when it came out over here, it was Sorcerer's Stone. I know that, but I didn't yeah. know why they changed the title. Uh, who knows? Who knows? the Philosopher's Stone is who a cares? real thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Why, why, does it, why does it matter? Why does one word matter? Like we're not going to read the book. What's weird is they call it the Philosopher's Stone in Fantastic Beasts when he... Uh, yeah, I know. It. Good. Like, uh, I know. I don't know. <laughs> then you had The Wash, which is kind of like Car Wash. I think that was from the 70s. It was like a Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg vehicle. Oh, I think I know what that yeah. means. Okay. And then in a limited release, you had Novocaine. Uh, so for anyone out there. Uh, so let's see. Director Tony Scott directed this movie. He has done movies such as called as Top Gun. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. The Last Boy Scout. Beverly Hills Cop 2, which I did not know he did Beverly Hills Cop 2, but then I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense because you can definitely tell the difference between number one and number two. It's got a lot of Scott stuff. Oh, yeah. I find that interesting that Tony Scott did it because you didn't list Scott Free Productions. I don't remember if I saw that as one of the production companies. No, that was probably before Scott Free. Before they oh, did Scott that. Free was? Okay. Oh, they didn't, they didn't really Scott and Tony Scott weren't. They didn't make they that. They didn't produce production. that. Yeah, no. I okay. mean, they probably didn't have like a, a shingle, as they call it. Until like back later. Then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a story screenplay credit by Michael Frost Beckner. He's done Sniper. Actually, he's done all the Snipers. All Wait, all of them? I believe so. Even the TV show. He wrote the story for Cutthroat Island, and he did the TV show The Agency. I think he does a lot of, obviously, military, intelligence, spy stuff. That kind of, I right. think that's his, that's his wheelhouse, except for Cutthroat Island, of course. Screenplay <laughs> by David Arata. Uh, he was nominated for an Oscar for Children of Men. Nice. He also did Broke Down Palace. And the Angel Cinematography by Dan Mendel, who has done cinematography for Star Wars 7 through 9, which is the new ones, Force Awakens, Last Jedi. Well, no, excuse me, not Last Jedi, Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker. He also did Star Trek 1 and 2. If you get the connection there, it's J.J. Abrams. And then Mm -hmm. he also did John Carter, which is now called not John Carter from Mars anymore. It's called John Carter. They've renamed I love, it. I love when they renamed it. The, just the like, things. just like, like Birds of Prey. How about when Birds of when Birds of Prey first came out? It was like Birds of Prey and the Emancipation of uh, what was her name? Uh, Harley the Quinn. Emancipation of, of Harley, Harley Quinn. Quinn. Yeah. yeah, it's like, and then that immediately after the first week, that was gone. I love that title. I liked yeah. how like they just didn't care. That title's annoying because it's so long and it's so obnoxiously long. <laughs> It'd be fun to put on a uh, 
the old sticker uh, billboards for the theaters. True. Oh, you imagine that? <laughs> yeah, right? You need some overtime? <laughs> Composer Harry Gregson Williams. He did Enemy of the State, The Rundown, Gone Baby Gone, and the TV show Whiskey Cavalier. And I only have that in there because I like that name. Have we talked about Enemy of the State before? That's the, like, yeah, when we did the conversation, because yeah. Enemy of the State is supposed to be like a sequel to the conversation. Supposed to be. Oh, never mind. That's, I'm thinking of a different movie. Behind Enemy Lines? No. <laughs> what? I can't remember the name. But the one with the snipers takes place in Russia. That's Rachel nice. Wise is in it. Oh, um, that's uh, that's with Jude Law, right? Yeah. And uh, fudge. Maybe that's behind enemy lines. No, that's the Owen Wilson movie. That's the Owen Wilson. Yeah, I can't what remember. What is the name that? What is the Jude Law one? It's something like behind enemy. It's a very similar title. Enemy at the Gate. Yes. Enemy at the Gate. Never that's mind. with Jim Caviezel, too, right? I think he plays the other sniper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember really liking that movie and wanting to put it on the list. Is that forgotten? Hmm. I think it's forgotten. That might be. I think you could put that on the list. I remember really liking it. I think you could put that on the list. Absolutely. Yeah. Edited by Christian Wagner, as Butler puts on the list. <laughs> he, he edited Romance, Face Off, and Fast and Furious 4 through 7. I guess he's not good enough for 8 or 9, but produced by Mark <laughs> Abraham. He produced uh, one of my favorite Harrison Ford movies, Air Force One. <laughs> I don't know why I like that movie so much. It's a popcorn it, feel good yes, movie. Yes. It's, it's really good. Agreed. Yes. He also did uh, The Family Man, which is a movie we did for one of our seasons two or three or three, I think. Which one? It's The Family Man. Yes. Yes. Three. Yeah. He did 13 Days, which is a movie I like. Also produced by Stephanie and Tosca. Excuse me if I said that wrong. She did The Contender and Looking for Comedy in the Muslim World. And Douglas Wick, who won the Oscar for Gladiator. He also did The Craft, Hollow Man, and Jarhead. He actually did The Craft, the new one too, Craft Legacy or something. All right, so you have Robert Redford in here as Nathan Muir. He was nominated for an Oscar for The Sting. He's also in All the President's Men, Three Days of the Condor, which is an episode we did, which is an awesome film, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, The Natural, Jeremiah Johnson, The Great Gatsby. If you don't know who Robert Redford is, look him up, watch the movies, check him out. He is really, 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 really good. We did a movie with him. I, I just said Three Days of the Condor. Where are you? Brad Pitt. <laughs> I, I don't think you mentioned that we did it. I, I said we did it. Oh, man. I'm you're pretty... not paying attention. You told me to put Enemy at the Gate on the you're list. You're not paying attention. Welcome to the podcast where you're not paying attention. Brad Pitt as Tom Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> he won the Oscar for acting in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I say that because he also won an Oscar for uh, producing 12 Years a Slave. Mm -hmm. He also was nominated for an Oscar for Moneyball, 12 Monkeys, and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. He's also in the Ocean's Trilogy. Catherine McCormick as Elizabeth Hadley. She was in Braveheart, The Tailor of Panama. Which I think that's the movie that I confused Palmetto with, by the way. You son of a bitch. <laughs> and 28 <laughs> Weeks Later, Stephen Delane as Chris Hark, Char excuse me, Charles Harker. He is more notably, uh, he's Stannis Baratheon in uh, Game of Thrones. That's the first thing I shouted when he yeah. appeared on the uh, I was like, it's Stannis! <laughs> he's also in The Hours and Darkest Hour. Larry Brigman as Troy Folger. He's in TV. Uh, this is, I'm going to tell you why I have this guy in the movie. Larry Brigman as Troy Folger. He is in a TV show, As the World Turns, a soap opera. He's in like a thousand episodes and he's in and Justice for All. But I kept watching this movie and I'm like, this guy is somebody I, I could tell by the voice. I, I can't place him. And the reason why I couldn't place him is because he had a mustache in the movie that I remember when he was in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I know this guy. And it took me an hour before I realized it was Die Hard with a Vengeance. This guy who wakes him up when he's like uh, talking about Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I know, I uh, know. You had Marine Jean Baptiste as Gladys. She's in the TV show Without a Trace. Fat Man, the movie Fat Man. She's also in the new season of Jack Ryan, which I didn't know. And she, I know her from, uh, she busted onto the scene uh, in Secrets and Lies, which is a movie that came out in the 90s, which I really like. And then I've got a couple people in here that are just kind of like background characters that are there for are there for a hot second. They're gone. <laughs> so you have Benedict Wong in here as Tran. He obviously for all those uh, Doctor Strange fans out there. I like Benedict Wong. Ken Leung as Lee. He is in the Lost TV show more no, most notably, but he is, uh, you know, Wong and Leung are everywhere. You probably see them yep. in a bunch of stuff. And then Charlotte Rampling as Ann Cathcart, who was nominated for an Oscar for 45 years, a couple years ago. And she's also in a movie that we did, Butler, which was... I don't know. D O A. You suck at this. I do suck at this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like when you point at me, man. <laughs> oh my god! All right, so I'm. I've talked for like a good thirty minutes. So you recommended this movie. I did. Okay. What? Um. You had never seen this movie. Correct? I've never seen it in its totality. Nice. So I don't. I do do like you want me to start, or do you want to start? Oh, uh, let's start with how you don't like it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Field. What did you think about the movie? I like when we get to kick it back to you because it's always like me first. I just talked for like 25 minutes. That's I why know. we always kick it to you. Fine. I really like this movie. Still? Still. Okay. I, like we've talked about it on the podcast before. While I really like mystery movies, 
I think your love of mystery movies is like my love of the spy genre. And so, I mean, I love how this movie really presents a more real world take on the spies and their job and kind of not glorifying them in any kind of way. It's like a really crappy job, <laughs> <laughs> but it's still really cool. Um, and it's really interesting the way they operate. I really like to look back on how you make a spy uh, in a way. And I forgot that this movie takes place in 1991. So that kind of threw me for a loop. Okay. I was like, wait, Nam, wait, what? Does this movie <laughs> go back to the present? No, it all takes place 10 years ago. Okay. I mean, I think that's very strange, but okay. There are parts that are a little, I guess, slow for some people. I would imagine that's why it didn't make a lot of money here in the States because we need stuff to be action packed and exciting at all times. And you can't have a slower, you know, thriller. I think this is kind of like a book come to screen in a way like this would work really well as a book when you're reading it, but maybe it's not quite as exciting on screen, but I find it very exciting and interesting because again, I really like this genre, but I know you had issues with like the Beirut stuff and it does kind of take up a giant chunk of the movie all of a sudden. So I think that was a little jarring that it's like that should have been maybe a little earlier in the film earlier rather than later. So I have some issues with how they structure it. Maybe I think that's kind of where I have some issues with now. But I still do really, really like it. I would put it on the list again, you know, having watched this now at 30 something and then you don't, you don't know your age. I don't want the people to know my age. 33. I'm 33. <laughs> I, I'll tell them. <laughs> I'd put it on the list now at 33 the same way I did when I watched this in 2001. I, I, I still really do enjoy this movie. But looking at it now, having gone to like school for film and having watched a bunch of other stuff, um, you know, having a lot more film watching experience, I do have issues with the structure of the film. So you're not a fan of the nonlinear style of of storytelling. I am. I just think that they present the Beirut stuff so late in the movie that at that point you just want to watch Redford or Muir save Tom Bishop. You're more interested in that at that point. You've gotten Tom Bishop becoming a spy. You've told his story and now you're going back to fill in a gap again. So I, I don't know if I like that. I think if that was presented a little earlier, mm -hmm. even if in a nonlinear way, Maybe that before we see Tom Bishop become a spy, it would help me a little bit. All right, I think with the pacing. Right. Because I know you had an issue with Beirut as well. I don't know if it was the same reason. Uh, it, I just felt that when they got to Beirut, it dragged a bit. And that's not really, it, it, for me, it dragged. I thought it was, but, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so when they got to Beirut, I thought it dragged a bit. Uh, but I know why it dragged because they needed to introduce the Hadley character, the woman he falls in love with in order right. to understand why he breaks into the Chinese prison to, to rescue her. So it's, you, you need to have it in there. I know that, but you almost need to have it in there more because you all, and there's a, the note here that I have a lot of times is that Tony Scott wanted more of the romance on screen, but the producers are like, no, and so most of their romance is left off screen. So what you have on screen is belief that maybe she's still playing him. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't really get any kind of sincere moments on screen because there's not enough of them. I get that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So that, I think that, that, that hurts it. The other thing is, and this is the, this is the reason, this is my empire strikes back reason too. that why I'm not a huge, I, I like empire strikes back, but when I was younger, I never liked them when they went back to Dagobah. Because it was the least interesting part of the story for me. This is when I'm younger. I always wanted the stuff that was happening, all the fighting and stuff like that. But there's an old Muppet in a hey, swamp. Just, okay, well, <laughs> I don't, I don't care. But anyways, so that was my whole issue with Empire Strikes Back. A lot of times, I was just like, I don't want to go back to this. This is boring. But in here, I was more interested in everything happening in the boardroom with right. Redford than I was every time they went back in to, in time to show. Brad Pitt's maturation to sniper or, or what have you. Some of the stuff was interesting. The Vietnam stuff was interesting. It just, I was more into the boardroom stuff, mm -hmm. but that's just me. That's, you know, that was, that was the one thing. So the not, I don't, I can sit here and tell you that the nonlinear stuff threw me off, but I can't sit here and tell you, I don't know how you fix that because would this work better as a linear story? I think you wouldn't be able to do it the way you did it here because you wouldn't be able to show you wouldn't be able to have a storyline where you show how Brad Pitt grew as a spy. No, you know what I mean? have to have Redford doing he, his thing only. He would, ha but it would also have to be, it would almost have to be back and forth, but in real time, you know what I mean? Not like you'd have to have a different story. Right. right. So, and uh, so you can't, that, that's not the story you can tell. So the nonlinear aspect makes sense. Uh, but I, it just, it kind of, you, you kept going back and forth. And then when you get to Beirut, you, you, you were stuck in Beirut for a while because you had to a be. A very long time. Yeah. And it just kind of, 
but kind of dragged a little bit. What if they peppered, what if they cut up Beirut and put it throughout the entire thing? So it was just Beirut. It was one mission in Beirut. I would have been okay with that. Or even, ah, this would be even more like nonlinear, but Redford is telling the other story about how he trained Brad Pitt. And then Redford thinks back to Beirut and stuff from Brad Pitt becoming a spy makes him think of different things that happened in Beirut. Well, you might have to right. change the Beirut story a little bit to right. match well, that. But. Why not have, yeah. Why not have Muir and Bishop meet in Beirut and Bishop is still a, he is a spy. He's fairly new. He thinks he knows everything, but he learns from Muir while they're in Beirut and have them in Beirut for two years. Right. And then that you can have everything play out within there and have the woman there for he knows the woman so long and just keep going back to that. Yeah, that might that might be okay. See, that's the problem. You bounce around as well. Yeah. And you bounce around at different things. And you know, some of it works. And 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 these are just I think these are nitpicks because these are just me kind of what kind of pulled me out. I think the other thing that pulls me out a little bit is I like Tony Scott as a director, mm-hmm. but I think his style sometimes gets in the way of some of the stuff. I just think I keep thinking of the rooftop scene when they're in Berlin and they go up stuff to sit down. Oh, I have notes about that. Yeah. yeah. And the helicopters going around the sh- and it's like, it's this big scene. And right. I know that Redford's quoted as saying he didn't understand that. Why they need, because it was, a, it's not a drone shot in 2001. It's a helicopter shot. So right. it's extremely it's way more complicated. He didn't, he didn't think that it would be, it would make as much sense to do that. But then he saw it and he thought it was really good. I disagree. I don't like it at all. I think it looked good. My issue with the scene is that it's so freaking stupid. It's just that table. Well, how's that table on that roof? Yeah. First of all, meet so on he's the roof. going. Let's meet on the roof. It's not a roof meant for a table. It's first of all, they're on like an air conditioning duct. Second, yeah. that roof is not meant to have that table on it. So what did he do? Did Mir go? Nah, I'm going to take this table from the cafe in the hotel. Excuse me a moment. Thank you. Yeah. Bring I, it upstairs. Yeah. Push it through the doorway. Came back down to get two chairs. Yeah. No. Three chairs. I'm sorry. So that Brad so Pitt that can, can throw, throw one. Yeah. Which I do like that. I like Brad Pitt's or yeah, t- Brad Pitt's acting in that scene. I think it's really good. I think it's a really well acted scene. I really like, you know, Tom Bishop's anger and how upset he is with Muir's cold coolness yeah. throughout the scene. I think it plays really well. It's just the entire time that that amp, they're on an air conditioning duct. Yeah. Even without the helicopters, they can't hear each other. That thing's loud. <laughs> There's no way that thing's not like crazy loud that they're underneath. Yep. And just like, uh, is this like some kind of super villain thing? I didn't yeah, understand. I it. didn't. It, it felt very much like a setup. It felt like we're watching a Batman movie, and you know what I mean. Like, let's, yeah, yeah, Bruce Wayne's throwing that chair over. It's yeah. Like, first of no. all, that's hitting somebody. That's hitting somebody on the street down below. Yeah, and that's that's my other <laughs> thing. And and maybe I just don't understand spies real well. But if I would assume you don't want to, you want to go unnoticed as much as possible. You throw a chair off the roof. Someone's not going. Oh, well, I'm not going up there to find out what's exactly. going on. And they're yeah. going to find two white guys, two Americans up there in in Lebanon. Uh, they were. Was were they in Ber- oh, they were in Berlin. They were in Berlin. It was still you're going to find two Americans in Germany. Oh, uh, hopefully they do a really good accent. I just <laughs> I just don't get why you do that. Yeah, it didn't make sense. If it was in a cafe and then they made a scene and then they kind of had to cover it up with like some dialogue about regular work or something that would make more sense. Yeah. And you can still play that same anger, that same emotion. Yeah. It just seemed like this rooftop looks cool. And you know, what yeah. else would be cool if Brad Pitt threw a third chair that for no reason. I bet you that was Pitt roof. who did that. Cause he does a lot of that kind of, well, that's yeah. I really like the fine. chair throw. I, I just, think that's really good. Yeah. I just think that, but it's, it's obvious ridiculous within the scene, but that's obvious why there's three chairs up there. Exactly. Like it would have been more sense if he threw the, his chair and he's just got to be like, and he's just standing. Yeah. Well, so that he can lean over the chair, or sit down, and yeah, have this moment of coolness. Yeah, I but know. If he did it in a cafe, I'd understand why there were three chairs. So Tony Scott paid for the helicopter shot because he thought he needed it out of his own pocket. Yes. So <laughs> I mean, whatever. It's it's. I mean, that's I, cool. It's not something I would have chosen to do. I guess it is definitely within his kind of style, right? Well, and it's something that I think the Bourne movies definitely copy after this. Well, which well, there's two different there's different directors for the Bourne movies. I think both. I think you think the Doug Lyman Bourne, the I Bre- think Doug Lyman and the Paul Greengrass, um, Paul Greengrass ones would also would both. Ah, uh, see, I think see, Paul- there's there's some carryover between both styles. Well, they're not totally different, and I think that some of it kind of takes this Tony Scott modern spy movie aesthetic. Well, let me uh, moving aside the the spy stuff. Let's talk about Tony Scott and his style. Before there was Tony, before there was Mr. Scott. <laughs> yes. You didn't see action movies like the way he directed them. And now, you know what I'm saying? Like, can you oh, think of somebody before before him? He's. I think of Tony Scott as like a more honed in 
in control, mature Michael Bay. Well, that's what I'm saying. Cause what I'm saying is that don't you think Tony Scott and, and, and some instance, maybe James Cameron influenced the way action films were from the mid eighties to the nineties. Absolutely. Okay. So then you would put Michael Bay in that as an influence. You put Yonder Bont from speed yep. as an influence, Richard Donner, maybe to an extent with the lethal weapon movies. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Peter Berg as well. From, Which, well, think of the rundown. Think of Battleship. Think of what. Think of well, Peter Berg's action. Oh, I thought you were just talking like '90s to early. Okay, I'm talking like about. Up, I'm talking general, from from today. then till now. Okay. Yes. And Peter Berg. Well, yes. well. Okay. Well, then give me anyone because I can't think of anybody else. But that, even Peter Berg a little bit. I think Peter Berg is more like Bay. From, uh, I was going to say, I think he takes more from Tony Scott. I because I think he's a more nuanced version right. of that again. Right. And he has like Bay's got a lot of that style, but Tony Scott adds grit as well, which I think Berg also takes a lot of. Do you think that they add substance? Are they just all style? I think if used correctly, like the helicopter shot might go all the way around and stuff like that. Might it's going around? It's very like haphazard. It's kind of also showing the emotion of the character. Sure. Way. Sure. So I think yes. Sometimes it's just style. Sometimes it's just this is going to look good for the trailer. Yeah. But sometimes it's it adds substance. It's something that kind of subconsciously makes you feel the scene a little bit more. Right. And to be fair, there's nothing wrong with more style than substance, or there's nothing wrong with your f- having awesome style and your as substance. You when we substance, talk about substance, yeah. we're talking about the script and the, and the movie, a- as long as your script and your movie is f- just fine. It just has to be like top gun or right. like Beverly Hills cop two, or even with Michael Bay, like the rock. That's the only one I'll ever do. Uh, you know, like I do not like the transformers. Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon's, Armageddon's got some decent moments. It's just a little long, but that's fine. It's a big summer movie. It's right. not, yes. But I'm saying that's like be Peter Berg, like battleship is, mm. but, but like the rundown. <laughs> you know, what's like, interesting is this is 10 weeks removed, but uh, we just released an episode where you mentioned battleship again. Do I? Yeah. It's always on HBO. HBO. I don't count that episode. I was like, I don't think anyone in their what, life has mentioned when you watch, when you watch the battleship, when you watch battle, cause it's not all the time and I'll watch it cause it's just action or, you know, I got to put something on that's a little bit like Dextro Lake or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I gotcha. But the thing is I watch it for like 20 minutes. I'm just like, yeah, then I'm thinking this is based on a board game for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of that, what I'm I'm trying to say is that I'm okay with style. I'm okay with a movie like that. You know what I mean? I don't need, like if it's a summer movie, I, I'm all in for aliens. I'm all, I know that's a classic. I'm all in for a Michael Bay movie. Let's watch some two two hours of action. That's fine. I don't, right. I don't, you don't have to give me a lot in terms of the story. Just give me enough where I'm like, oh, okay, I like the characters. That's fine. You exactly. I mean? yeah. Like even like a movie like Armageddon or Aliens right. or stuff like that. Right. There's characters with iconic lines sure. and characters that you enjoy. That's all I want. Even if the story's not That's great. all I want. But bringing it back to Spy Game, that's not this type. That's not this movie. This movie is needs more substance. You know what I mean? Needs I the you. substance to be just as good. And I'm wondering if this was... the if the, if it just was the mix, the ratio mix was off here. That's all. Because I like this movie to an extent, but... I don't know if it's a movie that I would be like, oh, I got to go buy this DVD or Blu-ray. You know what I mean? Are there any other scenes other than that one helicopter shot that you think you thought was more well, no, style I was just, over substance? I was just, oh, style over substance? Because I can't think of another like kind of, ugh, like that scene I wrote a note about, but I can't think of another scene that really well, made me go, mm. I'm not, uh, well, let me put it this way. I'm not saying that the style ever subverts the substance. What I'm saying is that there's not enough style in the movie. Okay, so like when they go and snipe the so guy, you want more or less. I either exactly. I, <laughs> okay. that's what I'm saying. Right. You know, because it, it defers to a lot of the script and and just kind of like the deeper elements. But I don't think, it, like, I'm wondering because it's Tony Scott. If I'm expecting more, I don't know. It, it's just a personal thing. Do you want a different director? No, I, I don't. I'm fine with him doing it. I, I'm 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 feel like I'm nitpicking for the wrong reason. I'm I can't I'm not really I can't really formulate what I'm thinking here properly. But let's, for instance, when you first meet. Bishop, right? He goes and he's going to go assassinate some unnamed Vietnam general for something. They name him, right? But it's <laughs> the scene's so quick. The scene, there's nothing. You know what I mean? There's, they get away, but there's no real like super action with it. Yeah, you know what I mean. What's weird is obviously I watched this like twenty years ago now. What I remembered in that is he snipes the guy, right? Well, he snipes and, it after the helicopter yeah, comes up, and, and yeah. he's got to stay in the brush for like six days or something, yeah, something like that. But, that's what I remember was like scenes of him just kind of like surviving on his like off rations and his own like. But they don't show it that exactly. much. Exactly, I yeah. thought they showed it more. 
And then he was impressed with that. But in this, it's kind of like he shoots the guy, they find him and it's like, you're going to make a good spy. Right. Why? Right. I really thought it was that. And maybe I'm thinking of a different movie that it was that waiting and waiting and surviving on his own that made him spy worthy. Like Mm -hmm. that's a survivor who can be out on his own for a long time. And then you go to the Berlin scene and he's trying to get the guy. And just to use another movie that we covered, Man from Uncle. Right. That scene. Think of that scene when they're trying to get to the wall and how. That is a very stylized scene. Right. And there's a lot of action going on. And then this scene is just, there's only a little, you know what I mean? Maybe I want a little bit more. Maybe that's what I'm saying. Go, go get to the. the I want hotel. more. I want more Tony Scott action style there. That's what I need in this movie. Now that might add 20 minutes. So maybe that's not something we could do. Right. But maybe that's what I'm saying. Uh, that's all. I do really like this, the montage when he's training Brad Pitt. And you don't really get any more of that kind of stuff. The, oh, yeah. That the, quick, um, um, get wait, in that hotel room. I want you in there five minutes. Which is based on a, a, a story from a, a book written by a former Mossad agent. Like that's what they would tell them. You told somebody to go that building over there, getting to that balcony. And yeah. And yeah. That's really that good. good. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. And it's all quick cuts and it's done very sleek and cool, mm-hmm. but yet still kind of realistic. It's not like they're doing anything crazy. Mm-hmm. And I, maybe if they put more of that in the missions, especially um, the quicker missions, like the opening sequence in China mm-hmm. in the prison or the closing sequence in China in the prison, <laughs> yeah, the do China, more yeah. of that kind of sleek no. stuff. And, and both of those missions should have been, I do like the beginning. I think it's pretty cool spy stuff, but the end mission is just kind of like quick in and out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we've been building up to this $282,000 mission to uh, save Tom Bishop. And then it's just like a quick 30 second clip, which granted it's not Bishop's movie. Right. But well, that's the thing. That's the other thing too. Do you think that there is a, another subplot or another plot line running here about the political nature of what Muir's dealing with? In terms of the trade deal that they're trying to subvert. There's, there's got to be. Why does it take place in 1991? Yeah, right, right. And uh, Shame on me. I didn't do enough research into like why it might have taken place in 91. But I didn't see anything here like really in the. I think, the yeah. Well, be, because putting your action in Beirut is you, you want it to be close to that day. I mean, this, the bombing, the the attempt at the bombing that they had where they drive the truck right through the. Right. That's kind of like the attempt on. Uh, Sheikh Fadlaha mm-hmm. in 1985, where the Lebanese militia, which were rumored to be or probably were affiliated with CIA, killed 62 <laughs> people and wounded 20 more. Same way, like like that's it's based on, on that, but that's I the 80s. That. So you want something super close to that. But there's nothing. There's got to be. I know there's other. Maybe it's an older script. Maybe well, it, it's but, 2001. So this was right. let's, let's put it this way. 2001. They shot this in 2000. Somebody probably wrote this eight years ago from this. You I know what I mean? That. And they've yeah. been shopping it in Hollywood forever. So that's probably why. And they just couldn't get around. Right. Uh, it takes place. Yeah. Like, we got to put Pitt in Vietnam. It's only 10 years removed from when they shot the movie. So for us, it's 30, but for them, it's 10. So it just it still seems like an unnecessary time placement. I don't mind that. I don't see. I don't mind. I, I don't. I, when movies that, are rooted. I'm sorry. The only other thing would be, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. You, I just realized this. There's no internet. True. So that could be another reason to put it in 91. Uh, but, it's like, it's more, you can't just contact everybody at all times. So sure. you just got to really work a little harder. But movies that are put back in the put in the past are become timeless because you don't, they're not dated. They're not, you know what I mean? Like when you have a movie that's so referential, not, this is not the type of movie that would do that, but when you have yeah. a movie that references co- current events and then you watch them 15 years later, you're like, oh yeah. You well, know, we like, talked about like we're putting John Stewart. In movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that. that's, that's, I don't, I don't mind that. Um, I didn't mind watching it, but at yeah. the end I was just like, did it need to be? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I told you this, we talked about this a little bit beforehand and I made this comment to you and I, I'm wondering if you remember me making this comment to you. So I'm watching the scenes with Redford and Brad Pitt, Robert Redford and Brad Pitt together acting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember me saying this to you? Yes. Okay. I want to, I want to go on record by saying that I like Brad Pitt quite a bit. I, I, I love him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he's really great in the ocean. Oh, I like Brad Pitt. He's a really good actor. But in this movie, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just because I care about the mirror character more or he has juicier things to do in the movie, which is fine. But I, there was such an, a difference between Redford and Pitt in this movie in terms of level of performance right. that it was like, I couldn't ignore it. Like I was just like, wow, he's like, even Redford just not saying like even the scene on the rooftop. And I know Pitt, Brad Pitt has to be pissed in that scene. I know that Bishop has to get upset. Right. And, and uh, Muir is just cold and calculated because he's, you know, the vet he's who's done it yeah. before. Yeah. I don't, maybe I just found that more fascinating, but I don't know. I just, I was just like, wow. I was more impressed with the Muir character maybe than I was with 
the Bishop character. And that might be, has nothing to do with performance. Maybe that just has to do with writing, but I don't know what you thought about that. Yeah. So you had mentioned that to me before I rewatched the movie. For okay. This. And so I'm trying to look for that. And I, I just didn't see it. I think you just, a, you really like Robert Redford. Cause he's awesome. Uh, he is great. But I think that yes, Redford has to play his character a lot more close to the chest, a lot more cool and mm-hmm. cold, especially in regards to Brad Pitt. That he comes off as a better actor because he's always keeping yeah. it cool. But Brad Pitt, I think, does a really great job in this role. I think that, you know, he's got these moments of being suave. He's got this angry upset. He's got a lot more. He's he's a lot more outward than inward. So it, it, I think it maybe shows that, oh, well, he's just overacting or this or that. But I think he does a, a really fine job. But I think when you look at Redford, Redford is always so cool in every scene. And then in the flash forward or the scenes in 1991, the boardroom, the boardroom, he's just so. It's his movie. Cavalier. It's his movie. So interesting and so likable. Yeah. That you're instantly it's it's tough to really like Brad Pitt. You feel for him and and you kind of like, oh, man, he's in shitty situations at all times in this movie. Mm -hmm. But. Robert Redford, even though you see him do some really crappy things and you can tell that he is cold, he is, he does what needs to be done. He is so cool and suave that you just kind of root for him a little bit more. See, but okay. Well, we're just back to Pitt's performance. This is not in your top five Pitt performance, right? Like in terms of like, when you think of, when you think of Brad Pitt and his performances in movies, this isn't up there. This is my, I mean, I mean, you well, think done, of seven. He's done so many good That's things. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's, but, but with Redford, see. Do you think this is a top five Redford performance? I don't. I, mean, uh, I really like this. I really like him in this movie, but I chose this movie. I know. But is this now all of a sudden on your top No, five? I'm just saying that this isn't the movie that you're, when somebody tells you, oh, do you like Brad Pitt? Oh, I love him in, this isn't the first movie that you're going to run off. Well, no. no, I got you. Because he's done a lot more iconic. I understand films, that, right. but but to Redford, but if, it was, you, if this was iconic, it wouldn't be. On but to your list. point about Redford, Redford has has more movies in his stockpile, yeah. and, and so it's not really fair to. I don't think that's a fair assessment comparison either. Yeah. Maybe maybe if you took the first, I don't know, twenty years of Redford and the first twenty years of Pitt, but you know, I don't want to do that because I don't want to compare the two. I will say this about both of them: they both have their own style. And they both carry that style in all their movies. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's not cookie cutter, like too many times now with young actors in Hollywood and performers in Hollywood that they all start acting the same. They all start look, they all start doing the same things. And while yes, it's they're acting and it's, they're doing it well. And that's fine. When you see 40 people doing the same thing over and over again, the same movie, it's so you desensitizes you to if they're good or not. Right. So like you could have somebody that's really good, but it's like, you don't know because they look like every other they act and look like every other 30 other people that came before them. Right. But with Redford and with Pitt and a lot of other actors that come in and see movies, they're on their own. Not that they're on their own level, but they're doing their own thing and doing it well. Right. And you're like, no one else does a Brad Pitt other than Brad right. Pitt. And you're like, okay, that's I'll, okay. And you're, then you're into that. Brad Pitt's always got food with him in a movie and stuff like I, that, but yeah. you like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The one thing that I will say watching Brad Pitt and Robert Redford is that they look so similar. Of course. And we've brought this up before. Yeah. The whole time I'm thinking, man, this should have been like a father son spy thing. Why, why haven't they done a father son, uh, Robert Redford, Brad Pitt team up movie? Well, was when Pitt came out, <laughs> when Pitt came on the scene. Everybody uh, compared him. Yeah. That was, yeah. that was the comparison because it's somebody who, he was somebody who obviously is very good looking. Much like myself, <laughs> but very, he's very good looking, but people always doubted the prowess, the acting chops. Right. And that's the same thing they did with Redford when he first came out. And they were destined to be in a movie together at some point. You know what similar. I mean? It's just like, well, I know it's, some, it's distracting when they're in the coffee shop at the beginning. <laughs> the training. It's like, yeah, you're, you're a dad. You're just so, a dad. So what you're saying is you would like a Robert Redford, Brad Pitt, maybe a uh, father son comedy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But Redford retires. So that's not happening. Did he? Did he officially retire? I think he's. Yeah. I think or is he's, he just close to retirement? I think he's in his eighties now. I think right. he's just kind of like, listen, I'm done. Listen, Clint Eastwood's in his nineties. I know. Good. Being God a baby, bless. Robert. Listen. God bless. <laughs> God bless. Uh, but no, that is another interesting thing about Brad Pitt, which I didn't realize until we were doing this movie, and I was taking my notes. Brad Pitt was turned down the role of Jason Bourne. Yeah. For this movie, I know. That's fine. I, I'm okay with that. I don't know how I would feel about like a. I, I don't think he would have been a good fit for that movie, but it would have been interesting. Uh, yeah. But I, I never knew that bit of trivia before. That's interesting. Uh, no, I mean, but it's we, tough we're also just comparing this to. <laughs> and, um, it's, that's Damon's character. Um, but I will say this, even though we're on the Bourne stuff, I prefer the Greengrass Bourne than I do to Doug Lyman's Bourne. Um, I, I really I like do. Identity. I'm, Supremacy is okay. 
Uh, but again, I we've had this conversation before. I don't know if on the cast. I don't think they got the shaky cam right until Ultimatum. But I love Ultimatum's my favorite. I like I like Paul Greengrass. I love Bloody Sun- Bloody Sunday or is it? I think or is it Sunday Bloody Sunday? Bloody Sunday. I like. I really like. Hey, listen, when you do a movie like United ninety three, where you know how it ends, and yet. You think they're gonna? You think it's gonna end the other way? You think it's like that's impressive. And I, I loved United ninety three. I I just I liked News of the World. He did that. So mm-hmm. I mean, I like Paul Greengrass. So not that I'm saying he's better than Doug Liman, but I'm just saying I prefer Greengrass's Bourne movies than I did to the the first Doug Liman movie. Oh, Although he did Mister Doug Liman did Mister Mrs Smith, and that's got some cool action. So I'm I was okay with that. Yeah, I don't really like Mister Mrs Smith that much. He, watch if you watch it again. The problem with Mister Mrs Smith is that it was so much hype going into it because they were a couple at the time, right? And everyone's like, "Oh my god, finally!" That's the other thing. They've got to get into an action movie together, like all that nonsense, right? But when they start fighting. It's it's when they wreck the house and it's all that well stuff. Done. It's actually pretty good. And right. then when they start fighting, everyone else starts going after him. It's it's funny. It's it works. It works. It's short too. It's not that long as long as you think. I'd have to watch again. I hadn't yeah. watched it since it came out. Even the opening but. when you see the differences in how they work, and he comes he comes out of the jeep, the doom buggy, and he's mm-hmm. like he's dancing to the song. Like it's, it's funny. It's I good. like the dinner scene. The dinner scene yeah. is one of the only things I really yeah. remember. But that was well done. No, it's it's definitely. I think it had a lot of hype to it, and then. Maybe just the hype kind of killed it. Yeah. Which often it does. And we've gone on a lot of tangents today. Listen, spy movies, man. <laughs> Tony Scott has said, uh, bef- I don't know, for those who don't know, Tony Scott passed away in 2012. So if, if we refer to him in the past tense, that is why. Um, but he has said that this film is like a James Bond movie. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Because I, I, don't, I don't picture this as a James Bond movie, especially like an American James Bond movie. I would have a hard time even comparing it to... Some of the earlier Fleming novels. I mean, it's it's definitely more like a novel than one of the movies. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's close to From Russia with Love, okay. in terms of its kind of very Eastern European kind of setting and and style and kind of grounded realism. But even From Russia with Love had some stuff going on. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. This a Tom Clancy novel, a Jack Ryan kind of novel, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's cool, and obviously, it's a buzzword to say, "Hey, it's like James Bond," because that's going to put butts in the seats. But it yeah. really—they're always trying to find an American James Bond. You got bored, you know what I mean? And you got—no, but I know that. But they're always trying Mission to find Impossible. that, or they're always trying to like. And I know they're going to do this now, but they're always going to try to find an American Harry Potter. Like, you know what I mean? They're always going to try to find a version of uh, an English IP that is so huge. They always try oh, to I get do that. that. You know but what I mean? Maybe not films, but a lot of television stations in other countries. Try to get the the oh, of course. them version of our show. Of course, so oh, well, I think, it all goes around. Isn't there a, a Czech Republic or a Turkey Sopranos or yeah. something like that? Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. of course they I always do it. that. Yeah, but you know, I think everyone wants something like when they have a hero, they want a hero that is theirs as well, which makes sense. But I think in terms of like a James Bond thing, you're not going to you're not going to get the American James Bond. I got you. You got born and you got. Tom Cruise and they're both kind of halves of the same whole, mm-hmm. but you're never going to get that exact formula. You're, right. you're just not going to, that's something you can't replicate. Like if you want to do an American doctor who you no. can call him doctor who, and you can do a doctor who with an American accent. It's not going to be good. Well, they tried, but to, you can't do just their they, own thing. That's clearly going to be just be doctor who and people aren't going to want. Well, they tried to put when they did the Torchwood show, uh, which was like the spinoff of doctor who. Right. And they put that, in the put the last season on stars and was in America. I didn't mind it, but people, it was, it didn't go, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, it's not Torchwood, but I, I actually like Torchwood, but you know, Torchwood is good, Yeah, but they didn't try to read. They didn't know all new characters. Right. 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 They like always that. have that. They always, every year you always see Bruce Campbell as the, the doctor. They always do that. Always right. do that, which I'd be fine with that, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Campbell is every genre thing. They want Bruce Campbell. I know. I know. When uh, enterprise was being, made everyone was oh, like right. petitions for bruce campbell to be the captain that's because and stuff he's like so that. charismatic and he's really likable yeah yeah. yeah yeah no i get that well back to this movie <laughs> so in 19 is 1991 yes redford uses a sat phone is that what he put he remember he has like i thought it was a cell phone and then you were talking about 91 right at one point he pulls a phone out of his pocket and it i'm i'm assuming it's a sat phone isn't it like a white big white phone i think it's just a regular cell phone so what in 1991 i can't remember where he pulls it out i remember the scene but i can't remember where he's pulling it because i'm trying to remember when i first got my kyocera phone and i believe that was in 93 but maybe okay it could be a sat phone yeah i mean those aren't new yeah so and he would definitely be somebody who would have it 
Did you uh, did you like the whole stuff where, where they were talking about his wives? I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. And, and he only has only been married once. I actually thought for the life of me, I was like, it's going to be a secretary, right? Like that's going to be his, his wife. wife. But then I was like, oh, I kind of wanted it to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't believe he gave away all his money to Brad Pitt for the mission. Like he's, he's pouring out he his owed it to job. Him. Yeah. He owed it to him. But now he's broke. <laughs> uh, but did you like Stephen Delane's character? Did you like Charlie Hack- Harker? Uh, I... I know they were trying to set it up where like Redford would out duel him like because right. he was being a he was being a, a a son of a bitch kind of thing and trying right. to get him. But it was like they didn't go far enough both ways. Like he wasn't actively trying to to frame him and Redford didn't like actively just kind of like you almost want Redford to turn him and be like, like wink at him or something like, you know, like I got you. But you right. never got that. So it, I know what they were trying to do. I just kind of wanted a little bit more. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't a big fan because he kind of came off a little too villainous. Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're on the same side. You guys are like not like I get that you're trying to maybe set up Tom Bishop as a patsy. I would have liked it more if it was a, a more playful kind of competition. Maybe. Or B, mo- give me some moments where it seems like Charles is actually on America's side, like he's not just like a backstabber, just like a son of a bitch. Well, they're trying to get Bishop. They're trying to. They're I understand. Trying, trying to find a, a way. These guys trying to find a way to to pin this on to Bishop so that they can disavow it. So then, why do you need to go at Muir so much? Exactly. This yeah. guy who's been working in the in the service for mm-hmm. probably 50, who's retired years. Yeah. yeah, and you're going like literally attacking him. Yeah, and clearly he's friends with everybody. I just didn't really buy it. I also did not buy Stephen Delane's accent. <laughs> it kept okay. dropping. I was just like, "You're English, dude." I, I would have liked it more if he was maybe MI6. So you're always over. The, you're all over those accents. I don't like when they slip. I know. I got you. Because gotcha. and, and I get that it's hard to keep an accent and also act at the same time. It's tough. But the director should be catching that and going, "Can we just do that scene again? You kind of slipped up, or have a dialogue coach on set." Well, like, I just again, we're going back to Tony Scott, and that's probably not his strength, which is not a bad thing to say. It's just I get not that. his strength. We think a dialogue coach. I, I understand know. that. It's I just, just he's probably focused on trying to move the camera. I know he made a comment that the the scenes within the boardroom were the some of the more tougher ones for him to shoot because a lot of the action is on screen. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get the uh, X Files connection here? Uh, that Robert Redford smokes Morley cigarettes. And who else smokes Morley's, Mike? <gasps> the cigarette smoking. So what we're also known saying as here, CGB Spender. So what we're saying here <laughs> is that uh, definitely Muir is in league with the plot uh, to colonize the. America. Everyone who smokes Morley cigarettes is in league. Clearly, clearly, I think he knows about the bees. Do you think that Annabeth Gish? Uh, I can't. Remember, what was the character's name? Uh, Reyes. Do you think that Monica Reyes was also wiping Muir's butt? Uh, Absolutely, uh, taking care. of <laughs> Whoa. The ridiculous turn. I don't know why she did that. Okay, go ahead. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> Apologize. I don't understand that, but go ahead. Well, you were watching this movie. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I kept thinking of Muir as kind of like the grown-up version of the guy from Three Days of the Condor. I think that's the kind. Well, that's they kind like, of reference that, yeah, but I it's like, help eh. thinking that like, no. What if like I, I don't he think does so. join no. and just keep doing I, it? I, I don't think that. Well, I don't think that they because, did that, but I kept thinking couldn't take it out of my head. In Three Days of the Condor, he is. Um, and for the lack of a better term, he is a liberal in Three Days of the Condor. You know what I mean? He is not part of the system. Oh, I get that. And I don't think he would last within the CIA. I think he was in that to just read the text and all the do all the uh, the grunt work of the oh, spy. I get you know that. what I mean? I don't think he would. St- I don't think he I would just be any help. part of that. I just couldn't help still seeing that same kind of character kind of right. thing going on. I got you. That's all. So, why do you think it's forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's forgotten because if you don't have a vested interest in the spy genre. I think it is rather slow. I think that's something that you really have to, you can't just watch this and go, Oh, it's a spy movie. It's going to be so cool. Yeah. But do you think spy movies have to, that that's something that the genre it has it against it, that they need to make sure that they pull the interest in like something like we did Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Right. Do you think that that movie and this, we need to hope that people coming into it already are into the idea of the genre, or do you think that they have to worry about, pulling the casual viewer into the spy genre. I think that if you're not going to do something like James Bond, like mission impossible, like mad from uncle, like born yet you, you, and you're going to do just a straight up spy thriller. Like, I, I think that that's something, yeah, you do have to worry about. I think you have to have a hook. I think you have to have something that's going to entice the viewer to watch because otherwise they're going to drop off. They're not going to be interested in this. 
you know, if I showed Elise this movie, like at two o'clock in the afternoon where she's not going to fall asleep while watching it, she would not find this interesting. Right. She would doze off or just pretend to like it because I like it Mm -hmm. um, kind of a thing. I, I don't, I don't think this movie is for the masses. And I think that it does slow down during the Beirut stuff. So a, a lot of stuff, like if they, even if they did watch it for Redford or for Pitt, they're going to lose interest because it is rather slow. Yeah. Yeah. And the nonlinear storytelling. These are one of these. This is a movie that you on. You get a lot of single dudes walking in to see this movie or groups of guys. Not to say that this is just for guys. It's not. But that's the majority of the, the demographic for this type of film is mostly guys. Right. And that's again, that's not saying that it's not for everybody else. I'm just, you know, that's that's who when you work in the theater, you you know what movies people are going to see sometimes when they walk in. When it's like a single dude, you know, they're going to go see the spy thriller or something like that. Right. Yeah. I know that my wife wouldn't probably be into this movie, but, you know, whatever. I mean, but say, you know, Brad Pitt's good to look at. So maybe that's one reason why people. I don't know. What's but, weird is Brad Pitt doesn't age in 20 years. Of course not. That's because that's good living. Yeah. Does any do, does he do toxic uh, flushes all the time? Well, I don't know. I just mean the movie takes place over a period of time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's true that probably from like 91 to 2001, he probably did. He, yeah, much they've clearly things. made a deal with some kind of demon. And <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I do think you, the spy movies, you do have to be into them. You do like maybe the books or, or not the books for this movie, but like spy books or spy novels or, mm-hmm. you know, I like. You know, Zero Dark Thirty was on the other day, and I mm-hmm. and I was like eleven thirty, and it was like on, and I watched the whole thing because I, <laughs> I I like those type of movies, uh, even though you know that it's not it's flawed and it's it's really just kind of like, but we're doing this. It's really you know it's not. There's tension, there's drama, but there's not melodrama. It's just kind of like right, you know what I mean. So you know you do have to be into those type of films to really get a lot out of it. And you're right, it doesn't. This isn't the type of movie that, especially on like. I mean, I know it's an adult film in terms of drawn adult drama action on Thanksgiving weekend, but I don't know if people expect that type of, it seems like more of like a Christmas movie. Yeah. This isn't a big Thanksgiving film. I think they put in Thanksgiving because they thought the names would just drop. Oh, I can, I can, I wouldn't fault that thinking. That that makes complete sense. Christmas would have been good. Uh, March would have been good right before the summer season starts. I think that this movie had more action than it did spy. Like if there's more you know, right. a lot of action set pieces. I think it would do well. You have you have action set pieces that don't even have any of the characters involved. Like you have Tom the Bishop, rescue. Brad Pitt running around trying to get the doctor to go into the to go kill the sheik. When and then, but the action in that scene is the pickup truck driving through of of unnamed extras driving into the and you know getting shot. Right. At. Pitt's not even involved in that. He runs into fish. Yeah, <laughs> but you, so that's what I'm saying. You don't. So there's not a lot of action set pieces. So I think maybe if you had a lot of those, you know, maybe that would kind of garner more interest and in, at the box office. Yeah, but again, that now changes. Your but movie. That, I, I know. Well, I, I, I understand. You know what does that really well? I think anyway is Jack Ryan. Mm-hmm. You know, the TV show, the TV show, because you look at the movies and Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger and even Hunt for October is very exciting. But they're well, rather, well, well, you came to that a little uh, like hesitant because it's I think it's a more exciting movie than Clear and Present Danger. Oh, no, it is. Exactly. Clear and Present Danger has got a lot more political intrigue. Stuff. I think both yeah. that and Patriot Games both do. Uh, Patriot, they both Patriot have Games has more sequence, action. Right. But yes, I agree. I agree. I think that the films are not very action packed. They're not. Sure. Very, they're more kind of like spy game but they're really well done and obviously harrison ford really carries those movies as well of course or, well and, the for the last two. yeah baldwin and and uh Sean worst, Connery. De- worst decision alec well never mind absolutely those films are able to do that well but then that's for an audience that's 30 years ago yeah now this audience wants something a little bit more exciting and i think that the series with john krasinski and john krasinski as a producer really worked well at making Jack Ryan still basically the same character, but making it more exciting and adding action elements and letting Jack Ryan kind of do stuff, but that they still also, works within his history, but they also get a lot of more time to do all that. Oh, I, it's a TV I understand show. that, yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. they work that within the character and the story, sure. but still making it this kind of more political uh, drama as sure. well. Plus, but you also have the Greer character uh, younger and they don't get along as much as they do in the movies, you know, they're, because they're much younger. It's more of a mentor mentee relationship in the movies. Yeah. But in the, in this it's they're they're he, like, they don't like each other at some point they do in, initially, but they come, they, they butt heads. Right. Yeah. So but like you look at 
the Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit or whatever. Uh, movie. No, I don't want to look at that movie. <laughs> I, I didn't hate it, but I didn't like it. It definitely wasn't a Jack Ryan movie. No, but they they took they did the same thing where they look at his backstory and mm-hmm. then they kind of pumped it up way too much. Yeah, I think this move this Jack Ryan movie really does it well. And I think if Spy Game maybe was remade, I think with the right look and the right kind of you don't need to remake this. There's I'd plenty not of remake it, but I mean like do something do. similar. Yeah. You could do a movie exactly like this with some action. Yeah. Without ruining what it's trying to be. Mm -hmm. But I think that is very difficult. And there's a fine line when you're doing that while still making it kind of a, a taut political, like spy, spy Uh, thriller without being overblown. The problem now with spy throws is it's all digital. It's all, uh, it's gotta be all cyber. You know what I mean? That's, that's what I mean. The boots on the ground kind of thing. Like you're wondering like where the spy genre is going to go from here. In terms of present day spy genres. Well, I think that's something that James Bond tackles now in the last like True. three movies. That's been like the relevance of. But that's the thing. Like it's always like. That's now the plot of every James Bond. But that's the relevance. Of but him. it's always <laughs> it's always got to get to the terminal. I've got to upload. Like it's not exciting to go, to go on the type on the fast on the computer. Uh, but did you see how quick he puts that USB <laughs> drive in? No one in movies ever has the issue where it's like up, but, upward, downward, but upward, downward. But, I can't get this USB drive. But I want like one spy genre where they're like, okay, you're gonna learn how to use how to use guns and tactical warfare, and oh, oh, and but you're gonna have to also learn how to write code. What? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. You need to learn how to do HTML in there. Go, go. This is your Python station. What's what? gonna What's gonna happen when you need to rebuild a website? What's gonna happen when you're gonna have to do that? Well, funny story. Uh, another spy movie that I put on this list, The Recruit. Kind of deals with that a little bit. Uh, the recruits in the nineties too, though, right? No, the recruit is sometimes uh, two thousand. That's with, that's with well. Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. the two thousand. I, I know what you're talking about. But that all, that Colin does kind of deal with more like trying to get people that are more uh, versed yeah. in that world. Oh yeah, no, I got you. Yeah, yeah. But you're right that most of them don't do. That. Yeah, now yeah. it's all like you know, it's I don't know. Interesting. All right, I guess we're done. I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> I think we went on enough tangents and did, also. Did we even talk about the movie? movie? <laughs> we did. We never even talked about. Hadley, the character that Catherine McCormick, which is you know shocking because she's just an afterthought in this movie. Yeah, she's useless in this movie. And she's well, just the thing that he's yeah, going after. Yeah, yeah, he goes after. And ch- oh, that was the other thing. Uh, did you like the clock stoppage stuff when they stop eight oh two p.m.? Did you like all that stuff? No, because there wasn't enough of it. Yeah, it just popped up three times. And the fact that they used the same footage over and over again, where Brad Pitt gets hit with the gun and they put the gun to his head, and they kept doing that. Yeah, his torture seem always the same. Yeah, it's the same torture. Yeah, and And also it's not good torture to break his jaw. You want him to talk. Yeah. Well, where's the electric stuff? I don't know. Although I do like the beginning where he stops his heart and he has to get the pills. Yeah, that was interesting. Cool. Yeah. Would you have liked it better? And this is I forgot about Hadley at all because again she's an afterthought. Uh, Would you have liked it better if the person he's going after is like his Vietnamese guy's like daughter or something is then like a, like it wasn't a love interest. It wasn't a love interest. He was helping out that Vietnamese guy and maybe the Vietnamese guy dies. I think maybe so if he's got to go after that daughter, uh, she becomes an activist or something. Yeah. I think maybe if it's a choice that he's making to right, he, he's making a, yeah. Um, an emotional decision, not based on his love, but an emotional decision to try to write, some wrongs in his life because i think not that be works like better with his character yeah i think you're adding up but you, you're gonna have to do a lot more rewriting in terms of oh beirut goes right, away yeah yeah or goes, the hadley or stuff beirut becomes just, like he finds her as an activist it's just it doesn't make it again i think tony scott was right in saying that he wanted to have more of the romance on screen because you don't get any of it so you, that's the byproduct of me go i mean you're sitting here going what is she what is she doing and like it doesn't come yeah. in until like an hour to the movie yeah or like it's the daughter uh it almost would be like if he had to go back to beirut Instead of going to China, I don't know. I mean, the whole thing with China is like, why? But like, right. if the do- if the doctor that he sent into the uh, building that dies, his daughter or something is kidnapped, or and he's or he goes to just the because he because you know, he wants ruined to that family, yeah. right? That makes more sense to me. And uh, like the whole thing, like everything taking place in China was just like. Why? Because it's China? Because, because the it's, trade talks happened yeah. in 1991. Well, I, I, why, why does it have to be so political? Why can't it be personal? And just make it, you can do the same plot line where they want to they want to disavow him. Because he's because, made a national incident. Right. Now, right. So why not just do that? Yeah. yeah. But it w- would work with, well within the theme of the movie, which I got you. kind of gets ruined. Yeah. So, but that might just be how the script developed and maybe they had, diff- I don't know, you know, it's always interesting 
how the script goes from, you know, from script to screen, uh, obviously you know, right. the term is and just the multiple changes and, you know, maybe China was bigger in the script uh, earlier than it was now. Yeah. Maybe they kept it in there. Maybe the, you, know, you don't know. And, and you, you kind of want to know because you really, it's tough to talk about the movie, not knowing some of the facts, but you know, that's not why we do it, I guess. So we're looking back. Hindsight's 2020. Uh, obviously, obviously. <laughs> so uh, tell everyone where they can find us. You can find us at forgotten cinema podcast.com or forgotten entertainment.com as we are part of the forgotten entertainment family. You can also find us on the social medias at forgotten cinema or forgotten cinema pod. And we post pretty much every day of the week. You can find fun commercials every Thursday that we do. Uh, we'll post quotes. We are starting to do interview episodes, bonus interview okay, episodes. We did one. Well. Let's just calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we get more people to say yes. Although if, from say my yes experience the on the beer podcast, most people say nothing. Who which cares? Is rude. <laughs> which uh, is rude. Which is, well, I mean, just say no. I mean, just, just shoot me down. Don't leave me hanging, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can find us there. Check us out as well as all our other awesome podcasts on Forgotten Entertainment. Nice. And join us next week when we will be doing a movie from my teenage years, Butler, and your early single digit years. Yeah, I definitely didn't watch this when it first came. <laughs> We're going back to 1992. We're going to watch White Men Can't Jump. Why Order. do I have two choices this on this? Or no. No, because we you got you got double choices because because of Frank and Weenie. Yes. Okay. That's why. Right. Okay. Then no one needs to know the mac the machinations of behind I'm the just scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I got that word in there again. Nice. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's it. That's next week. White man can't jump. Wesley Snipes, uh, Woody Harrelson, Rosie Perez, Mike Butler, Mike Field. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema. And I was not in White Man Can't Jump. <laughs> well, you can't jump though, and you are white. Oh, how dare you? <laughs>